I've quite seen in quite a while. Just so excited to have you guys here. Um, I appreciate my Loft family who drove some of you from great distances to be here. I appreciate you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, I love you guys. Um, Kathy was going to be out of town and she contacted me to see if I would come speak in her place. And uh, back in the summer, I just told the Lord that if he ever asked me to go somewhere and speak, if my calendar was open, that I would never say no. Um, I would not waste my time or yours if I hadn't had just an amazing and radical encounter that happened last, last summer. Um, many of you have known me for years, so you know, you know my family had a solid upbringing, sound background, raised in church, and uh, actually gave my life to Jesus at the age of 18, and had a lot of disappointments in life. You know, we give our lives to Jesus, but that doesn't guarantee that everything's going to be perfect. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said, in this world you'll have trouble. He assured us that we would have trouble, but he said, I've overcome the world. And uh, scripture, that I, I don't even know which one of it is, but I, I can quote it to you. It says, if anyone be in Christ, old things have passed away. And behold, I love the word behold because it means to look upon, to stand in amazement and look upon with amazement. But it says, old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new for those who are in Christ. And I can stand here right now, and some of you know my testimony. My mom may have shared my testimony with some of you at church. Uh, some of you may have seen me post things on Facebook. I didn't used to post anything about Jesus on Facebook. I kind of dwindled into my own life and pursued everything that anybody would ever want to pursue. Education, job, new home. Nothing wrong with that. But after all that was over, I still had this emptiness inside. It did not satisfy. And I thought, you know, there's got to be more than this is not enough. And I was, I'd given my life to Jesus when I was 18, but the scripture says, if anyone be in Christ. I wasn't in Christ. I gave him my life. But then it was just like, let me just try my best to be good until I go to heaven. I'll try to be good. I'll teach Sunday school. I'll play the piano at church. I'll be on the worship team. And that went on. And I had a, a couple of isolated, true, powerful encounters with the Holy Spirit when I was about 18 or 19 years old. Radical encounters. I felt tangible presence of God. It wrecked me. I knew he was real. But I found myself looking back. It's like I would look back to what happened 26 years ago. Oh, that was great. I, I experienced God 26 years ago. But in the present, I was a mess. I was in church every week. I was actually a single mother for, as I said, things didn't work out the way I planned. I got married the month after I turned 18. And uh, my first husband was unfaithful to me within four months. So when we all plan out our lives, you know, when we're young and we, the world is our oyster, so to speak, and we plan out the way we want it to be, we want to marry this person, everything's going to be, you know, this will make it right, or, you know, it's all about our identity and where we find our identity. But I was looking for my worth and my value in a relationship. And so things began not working out according to my plan very soon. Needless to say, I stayed in my marriage for 11 years even though, but there was just, an just ongoing issues, and I, I don't want to vent about that, because that's not why I'm here. But suffice it to say that it was 11 years of misery for me. Had two kids in the process, but I did everything right. I dedicated my babies to Jesus, took them to church every week, and even, and eventually after 11 years when I did divorce my first husband, during that five-year point when I was a single mother, I knew that if, you know, I, I was so vulnerable at that time made a lot of mistakes, but I knew that I had to keep my kids in church because I knew that I was the priest of my home, and I wanted them to know about Jesus. That was, and I knew no matter what kind of garbage is going on in my life, I've got to try and press in. So I took them, raised them up in church, and I don't know, guys, I'll just be real with you. It, I was just so dead. I was completely dead inside. 
uh, it was just, going to church was just religion to me. If I would go, I would go week after week after week after week, and it was the same thing, over and over and over and over. And I was just discouraged, and I was like, oh, 26 years ago, I wish I could feel that again, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, just got to the point. But, you know, I can rever reverse for a second. Things were repetitive for me, and they were boring. But God is not repetitive. God is not boring. God is a God of the unexpected, and he has rocked my world over the last 14 months. And the scripture that says, old things have passed away, all things have become new, right here. Not just me, but my daughter who could not be here. I wanted her to come share, because God has done radical things in that girl. I mean, it just like, just started touching our family. But, uh, make a long story short, I would go to church on Sunday mornings, had this new house, had a good job, had my degree, had everything that the world says is important, but I was getting more discouraged every day. Uh, so I began drinking. I thought, you know, I haven't drank in a lot of years. I began drinking alcohol, and of course I hadn't drank in a long time. One drink, and it, I felt good. I thought, I like the way this is making me feel. The problem is, is that that, be that became what I looked forward to every day. And it got to where it would take more and more and more. It was taking lots of money. And all, I couldn't wait to get home so I could sit on my front porch and drink. I drank myself to passing out more than once. I would be tearful. I was angry. I was bitter. I hated life. Uh, but I was the religious woman in church every Sunday. Religion is not enough. Church is not enough. I needed life, and I was not getting it. I was dying. It, did, it didn't matter what was going on on the outside. I, mean, I was dying in here. And it didn't, you know, I hit it well. People didn't know. My, by this time, my son has grown up in college. My daughter, at this point, was 16. And I'll talk about her briefly. Uh, my son's very gregarious, outgoing, never met a stranger. He blooms everywhere he's planted, involved in everything you can imagine. And my daughter, on the other hand, is very shy. You know, she was always, you know, more quiet and more of a bookworm and, and, you know, just kids are different. But I started noticing things with her uh, a few years ago. She, you know, she was maybe 10 years old, but she was having social anxiety. So much so to where she could not walk up to a counter and order ice cream. And, you know, I was like, you know, Jada, this is the real world. You've got to learn how to, you know, you've got to be able to do this. So I would, you know, I remember that day I basically forced her up there to order her ice cream because I wanted her to conquer her fears. And I didn't do it in a mean way, but there were just little signs of things that I did. I just thought, you know, she's just shy. And I, you know, would explain things away. Um, so anyway, meanwhile, by the time Jada is 16, this is when I start, start drinking because... Nothing the world, I mean, I tried everything in the world and it was not satisfying me. And I was basically drinking away my pain, or trying to. I was not looking for fun. I was hurting. I was hurting and I was broken. And I was trying to drink that away. But it does not work. It just makes things worse. Uh, my marriage, we were a very rocky. I, we just moved into this house and I sat my husband down and I said, look, we've been married for 10 years. Jada will be a senior next year. When she gets through high school, I said, why don't we just see where we are at that point and decide what we're going to do. All the while, we're in church every Sunday morning. We're there. And even my daughter was uh, in a youth group on Wednesday nights. But I hid this well. You know, my daughter was always in her room, so I hid it for her. She did not know I was drinking because she was in her own world. But I remember one particular point. Had went long after we moved into her ho our house. She was just very tearful, just emotional and tearful, and she just fell on her knees in the in the hallway of this new house. And I said, Jacob, what is wrong with you? And she's just crying. And she said, I don't know what's wrong with me, Mom. She said, I don't know. And, you know, I, I couldn't figure it out, but I thought, you know, I explained it away. It's the first time I've raised a teenage girl. I thought, okay, it's hormones. You know, I tried to attribute everything to, you know, I just tried to explain it in my own mind. Well, I had no idea what was going on with her at that point. Um, so, it was in Jan around January of 2015, I saw where one of my Facebook friends had liked a status. 
And that status entailed uh, a couple of people going to a little Christian school, not far from where we lived, and they had a chapel at this Christian school. And during chapel time, they were praying for a bunch of little kids, and these little kids were getting healed of various things. They, they were taking off wrist braces, a boy's eyesight. I mean, God was healing these little kids, and they said that the chapel time lasted over two hours. And that caught my attention because, man, I have not heard of anything like that happening in so long. I was stuck in my religious rut. I had church hopped for eight years. You know, I was in a church solid for about eight years, but then the church split. And I church hopped for like eight years trying to find something. I was, I was looking for something. The problem was I was looking for it out here when, when I needed it in here. So I saw this word where this had happened. I thought, you know, who is this person? And it, it, the, it's Josh Atkins is his name. Some of you may have heard of Mike Atkins in uh, West Frankfurt. has a big singing ministry. has for years. He's, he's an evangelist. Travis Wilson happened to be his son. So I knew who the family was. But I just started... Out of curiosity, I thought, I'm going to follow and see what God is doing. Because, I mean, this was exciting, and I hadn't heard of anything like that happening in quite some time. Every time they would do a post, they had this, they had like a Bible study that they started. Carl and Steph, you were the original eight of that Bible study. Carl and Steph, they started a Bible study. There were eight people. And I think God spoke to Josh like in early 2015 and said, I want you to start a Bible study in your apartment on Tuesday nights. It was that specific. Simple act of obedience, this group of eight, they had the same vision. They were after God. They wanted his presence. They wanted to encounter him. Because apparently, religion wasn't working for them either. They wanted more. So this group, of this small group of eight people, started a Bible study in January of 2015. And by July, they had 90 in an apartment. 90 people traveling from, I don't know how far away they were traveling from. You guys know? Sometimes he, everywhere. People traveling for hours one way. Do you know why? Because God was encountering people there. And it's nothing special about the group other than they were taking what was in God's word and applying it and believing it and stepping out and being obedient. So God is touching people. People are being physically healed. People are being delivered of drug addictions. I mean, people are coming and they're leaving not the same way they come in. And I thought, man, and I start forwarding these statuses to my mom. And she's like, whoa, she said, we need to go visit that place. And she didn't know that I was abusing alcohol every day, but I thought, yeah, you know, let's go. I'm all for it. We went on July 7th, 2015, up to the apartment. This was on her birthday. And somehow I got my daughter talked into going with me. And she went with me that day. And I was just watching, taking it all in. People were getting touched. I thought, this is great. I didn't go up for prayer because I was not, I was not ready to you know, and to walk up and just, I don't know. I just wasn't ready to get rid of the junk quite yet. But I watched, and I observed, and I knew that what was going on was real. So, that was like early July, and late July, I ended up taking somebody else. By, by this time, they're moving out of the apartment, because the landlord says, 90 people in this apartment, you got to go. This is not going to happen anymore. I guess they were afraid they would cave the floor in. <laughs> So they were moving into a new building, just down a couple of a couple of doors down down the street. They were renovating, painting, and I took somebody else who'd been having an ongoing physical problem, like an infection that had gone on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I said, "Hey, I don't know how you feel about healing, but I know of a ministry just up the road where God is healing people. Do you believe in healing? And do you want prayer?" And they're like, "Yeah, sure, I'll go." And uh, so. They're not even having a meeting. They're, they're painting up the new building. They didn't know we were coming. And I'm kind of standing back, kind of watching this person get prayer because I thought, you know, God's going to touch them. I'm here just kind of watching the show, so to speak. And about that time, one of the leaders, her name is Lydia. She's not here today. She's actually in Mozambique, Africa on a missions trip. I didn't know her at the time. I'd only visited up at the apartment like one time. She came around and put her hands on me and started praying for me. Now, I had to come for prayer. I took across somebody else for prayer. There was a little group, you know, a group of people praying for them over there. She started praying for me, and she started speaking things over me that only God, she, she, there's no way she could have known it about my life, that it was God revealing to her as she prayed for me. And about that time, I started shaking. I just started shaking, because I could, I could just feel the tangible power of God just starting to settle. 
And then Josh came around and had not heard anything Lydia had said. He started praying for me and said the exact same things. The exact same word came from him. Make long story short about me, I fell on the floor, fell under the power, weeping and weeping and weeping and shaking. And just like it was just the presence of God that I had not felt in over 25 years. And it was life. It was like all this pain was just leaving. I would just lay there on the floor and all this pain was just leaving. It was just washing me clean. And it was beautiful, beautiful in his presence. And uh, needless to say, I didn't have a desire to take another drink. It was gone. It was completely eradicated, completely eradicated. Didn't even think about taking another drink. to encounter his kids. We are his kids. He wants to encounter us. His kids, as a rule, from what I've observed, are walking around in the same bondages that people in the world who have never known Jesus are walking around with. People in the church are walking around with depression, anxiety, fear, marriage problems, porn addictions, drug addictions, alcohol addictions. These are people in the church. It's a fact. <laughs> Nothing against church. People need an encounter from God. Right. Because He changes us. Right. When if any person be in Christ, old things have passed away, and behold, look on with amazement because all things are new. So I got wrecked. You can just call it, that's what we call it. I got wrecked. <laughs> Two days later, I'm all by myself in the kitchen, and my life has changed. Like I said, I didn't want to drink anymore. I'm just sitting in my kitchen worshiping God and just thanking Him just for washing that garbage out of me. And I just said, but God, I said, I know there's more of you. Just give me more of you. And then something happened to me that had never happened to me in my life. I, and I'd seen it. I started speaking in another language that I've never, just, just as easy as I'm talking to you now, just started speaking this other language as I'm worshiping. And the power of God was so strong on me, I shook for days. It was just the power. I couldn't get ready for work in the morning. It was, I mean, it was radical. I started praying for my husband. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I, I stood in church just the Sunday before like this during worship with my arms folded, dead as a doornail, dead as a doornail, didn't want to be there. Matter of fact, I wanted to be home drinking that day. Hated it, felt nothing, didn't pray. But the following Sunday, I'm worshiping. <laughs> I got my hands up. I got my hands on my husband praying for him. I mean, it just, he brought me to life. Okay, meanwhile, my daughter's seeing all this stuff happening to me. Uh, and I didn't know it at the time, long after she told me that when we went up to the apartment on July 7th, there was a young girl there, 14 years old, that they laid hands on her and prayed for her. And now teenagers are not going to fake it. And, you know, and I've been in places where people fake it. I do not want fake. If it's going to be fake, I'd rather go back to drinking. This is real. I'm not going to put up on an ad for you guys or anybody else. I would not have come up here. You guys need to know that God is real. So we were up there on July 7th. This 14-year-old girl, they laid hands on her. She falls out, just the power of God. Boom, just a teenager. And my daughter did not tell me until months later. She said, Mom, now this is my daughter who I dedicated as an infant to Jesus. I had her in church almost every Sunday her whole life. She was in church twice a week. But she said, Mom, I came into that apartment as a complete non-believer. Sat there as a complete non-believer. She said, but when that girl fell in the floor, she said, I felt a gush of wind went through me. And she said, I looked at you to see if you had felt it, and you hadn't. She said, but right then, I knew God was real. So that sparked something in her. And so I think this happened with me. Mine happened at the end of July. Then I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. I told my daughter, I'm like, Jada, you've got to start coming to the loft. It's real. It's not church. It's not religion. It's not boring. You will encounter God. Just come and let him, let him change you like he has me. And uh, she just kind of made excuses why she didn't want to for, for a couple of weeks. And then in early October, we had been to Carbondale, and it was late, and we, pull, we were pulling into the driveway. She said, Mom, i got to talk to you. And I said, okay. So I shut off the truck. I said, what is it, Jada? She said, what I'm getting ready to tell you is going to be very hard for you to hear as a mother. She said, but I want to let you know I'm ready for prayer. And I thought, God, God had encountered me in such a 
strong way, there is nothing she could have told me that would have shaken me that night. Because I knew, because she said she was ready for prayer, that God was going to get her. And God was going to fix her. Because she had opened her heart and was ready to receive. And that is the key. He will not, no good thing will he withhold. All we have to do is open our arms and just receive. That's all he expects. That's all, that's the only prerequisite. He does not override our will. So I'm like, okay, Jenna, what is it? And she's 16 years old. She said, uh, I've had an eating disorder since I was six. First grade. That is a baby. I mean, teenagers, yeah. You know, a lot, big, big majority of teenage girls, or a high percentage of teenage girls do go through eating disorders. Her started at the age of six. Now, I have been an attentive mother during their young years. I cooked for them. I always made sure that they had healthy meals. You know, even during the time when I was a single mother, I cooked for them every night, read to them, was attentive to them. But here, and I was like, okay, what else? She said, I've been drinking and smoking. I'm like, no big deal. I was drinking and smoking at 16. You know? But she said, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know about her. Mom knew about me, but I didn't. She kept it so hidden. She was so quiet, just kept in her room. And she told me, she said, Mom, she said, I've been cutting myself. And I didn't realize, you know, I, I didn't understand the cutting. That's something I never did. The, I, I, you know, I thought, man, self-harm, self-harm. I said, and I started putting two and two together. So I asked my daughter, I said, Jada, I said, are you suicidal? And she said, yes, Mom, I am. And you know what? My peace was not shaken because I knew that she said that she was going to get prayer and I knew that God was going to fix it. Now, I had written out a few weeks, several months even back, I had taken her to a Christian counselor. She, they, her high school, she was in Carterville High School, had had multiple student suicides. And every time there was a student suicide, she would break down and go back and come home. This is before I knew that she was suicidal and cutting herself. So obviously when these students would commit suicide, it would stir something up in her. And, uh, but she was, at one point, because of the social anxiety, she was babysitting for a home group for a church. And she, she said, Mom, I think I need to go on medicine. I'm like, why, Jada? She said, because I can't talk to the parents without having a panic attack. And I feel like I'm going to throw up just by talking to parents of these kids. And I said, Jada, I said, I don't think we necessarily need to rush on medicine. But I said, let's go talk to a counselor and see. You know, I want to be a good mom. We're a church twice a week, but we'll go to the Christian counselor. So we went. They did an eval. Of course, she didn't tell the Christian counselor what was going on in her life. They didn't go through the checklist. She's like, no, don't drink, don't smoke, don't think of harming myself. No, no, no. Those were all lies. At that time, I didn't know. And uh, so the counselor said, Jada, you're just, you're just a moderate. You're able to still babysit in spite of feeling nervous. She didn't put her on medicine. She assured her she was okay. But the counselor did tell me, that even though she was in Marion, which is a larger high school, she said the biggest majority of my teenage clients are from Carterville High School. So anyway, so that had gone on. So she you know, told me all this, shared all this with me that night, and then this was... You know, just a couple nights later, they were going to have a meeting at the loft. They had their new, you know, moving into their new building Tuesday night meeting. So Jada came with me, and she sat in the back row. And it came time to get prayer, and she was scared. She said, "Mom, I don't want to. I don't want to go. I don't want to go up there." I said, "Jada, it'll be okay." Because that social anxiety kicked in. It's like a two-edged sword. She wanted prayer, but she was too scared to go up and get prayer. But I said, "Jada, it'll be okay." I said, "Look, Lydia's up there. Let's go up and have her pray with you." And I had not said a word to Lydia about Jada. So reluctantly, Jada goes up for prayer. Lydia starts praying for her and starts praying against self-harm and self-abuse. That's because that, that's just the Holy Spirit revealing that to her. It's not hocus pocus. When when Jesus, you know, the Bible says that we are united as one with Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit makes his home inside of us, that's that gives us the mind of Christ. And when we are in him, we get his thoughts. We are have the mind of Christ. So Lydia starts praying against self-abuse, and I sat and watched my 16-year-old daughter fall on the floor like a big tree would in the woods. I mean, she went down, and she wasn't a weeping, squalling mess like I was when I went down. She lay there just like she was in a trance. So we just gathered around her and were praying for her, and all of a sudden, she starts coughing. And I've never seen a 
anything like this until, you know, the previous few weeks, just people getting delivered of stuff, and it's not scary. Demonic stuff literally affects us. She coughed, she coughed. She was in the floor for an hour and 45 minutes. She was delivered of all of this demonic crap that had held her in bondage. She was delivered from all of it. And I want to tell you something as a mother to know that my daughter had demons. It was hard. That part was hard. And then I started, I, t I started taking on this guilt. I, I started coming into agreement with this guilt. And then, then the energy started working on me again, even though she'd gotten delivered. But that was hard. But the good thing is that, you know, God was taking care of it. And when she got up out of that floor, she was different. And like two weeks later, she was in her room praying for a friend. And she said, Mom, as I was praying, I started speaking in tongues. I was like, yes, because that's, that's what happened to me. And she said, Mom, I shook for over an hour. I'm like, I know, that happened to me. I'm, and it transformed her life because when the Holy Spirit gets in there, he pushes out all the darkness. And demonic stuff, it's not, it is not scary. It's not like what we see on TV or in the movies. Many people who have given their lives to Jesus get demonic oppression in them. You know, suicide, depression, anxiety, fear, addiction, that's all of the enemy. <coughs> you know, it's of the enemy. So, I started seeing a change in my daughter immediately. Uh, she would come to loft meetings. There would be strange adults she never met. She'd walk up to them, lay hands on them. Now, this was the girl that had social anxiety. Lay hands on them, start praying for them, and then she'd stop and look at one and say, you're having nightmares, aren't you? And the guy's like, yeah, I am. So, it's got, so the Holy Spirit is revealing to her what's going on inside the people she's praying for. She's laying hands on people. And God is using her in a mighty way now. She's now a hostess at Red Lobster, greeting people as they come in, <laughs> walking them to, you know, old things. To anyone who is in Christ, old things have passed away, and all things have become new. Now, I'm not going to stay much longer, but Jane started opening up more after God delivered her. And uh, her brother actually came home uh, on Thanksgiving break. This all happened October last year, a year ago. And her brother came home on Thanksgiving break and she opened up and started sharing more. And apparently during one, uh, when one of the kids, actually in addition to the completed suicides, there were several who attempted suicide and one of those happened to be a very close friend of her. And when we had just been with that boy, he came here to the farm with us on a Saturday, here to this hill. The very next day, he tried to take his own life. I had not a clue. This was before, this was long before the Holy Spirit encountered me and I got my touch. But I mean, but there were no signs, no warnings. He acted completely normal. So the very next day, he tried to take his own life, and my daughter called me weeping again. I go get her. And so she told me, because after God delivered her, she got home that day. And I can't even wrap my head around this. She said that she cut herself 90 times. 90 times, from elbow to, from, from shoulder to elbow, and from hip to knee. She cut herself 90 times, and I, I can't even, that is, a, that's just demonic stuff. Even the Bible talks about the man who cut himself with stones. It's demonic stuff. And one thing that I've noticed, we've started to share our story about what God has done in us, because I want to give people hope. Either church people, non-church, I don't care if you're in church, it doesn't matter. Because I want people to know that this thing is real, that God loves every one of you. It's not a game. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. And he wants fellowship with you. And he will give you, will fill you with life to where you're not just, not just surviving, but what you're really living. John 10.10 10 says that I came to give life and to give it more abundantly. And I used to have a problem with that scripture because I was dead in here. But now I'm experiencing it. So she cut herself 90 times that day. And here I am, I didn't have a clue, all this going on under my roof for I don't know how long. And um, that she told us about that. I'm like, okay. So I started sharing our story after she got set free and started realizing that there are a lot of teenagers and teenagers that are in church every week that are also cutting themselves. Because people have started opening up to us. 
these are these are teenagers in school every week, and they're cutting themselves, and they're drinking alcohol just to sleep at night. Church is not enough. I don't have anything against church. We're supposed to go to church, get the word in us. But if we don't have an encounter with God as an individual, we will be dead. Period. So she also told us that not only had she thought about suicide, she had a date picked, and she knew how she was going to do it. She was serious. She was going to hang herself from our balcony on our brand new deck at our brand new home on Christmas Eve. Her suicide date was Christmas Eve, 2015, and God set her free in October. <laughs> God set her free in October. I did not know. I didn't know. Didn't know. I knew she was tearful and just that. that meant, but it's, it's like I just started putting two and two together. And it's like, this is what's been wrong with her all, all this time. When she was weeping in the floor saying, Mom, I don't know what's wrong with me. She was really set free. So, uh, yeah, God set her free. And she is, she is all things are new with her. If she were here, she'd stand up and here in front of you and, and tell her story, let, and, you know, and share with you. But one, one more thing that she did say is the night that she went up to the apartment with me on July 7th, the night that she felt that gush of wind and she knew that God was real at that point. She said, I went home that night. I was completely freaked out. She said, I tried to cut myself, and I couldn't do it. She tried, and she said, that was it. She never cut again. So she has been set free. I've got people in this room who have been rapidly set free. But I, yeah, yes. He, he wants to do it to all, for all of us. And you know, we are all so good at keeping stuff hidden because we want to be religious. We want to, people to think we got all of it together. But we don't. We need him. And I just want to let you guys know he's real. In a room this size, percentage-wise says that there are people that are not walking in freedom. But he's here and he wants to encounter you. And he, you know, come up for prayer because I've got a whole team of people here that will pray with any of you. I don't care if it's depression. I don't care if you're suicidal. I don't care if you've got an addiction. I don't care if you've got anxiety. I, I sit there and run the whole gamut of it, you know. There's nothing you can say that, that's going to shake any of us up because I've seen, I've seen more physical healings in the past 14 months than what I can count. I've seen more demonic deliverances in the past 14 months than I can count. I used to just go sit in church and look at my watch and think, man, I'm going to go to lunch. Now, my whole priority, all my priorities have changed, my thoughts have changed. You know, that's why if you see me on Facebook, all I'm doing is talking about Jesus. You know why? Because he has filled me, set me free, changed my life. And there's nothing else. There's nothing else that will satisfy. You can, I can, the past 44 years put together, stack all my fun experiences up together, stack them all up, I don't care. And it can't come close to what God has done in just a short amount of time. I'm really, I'm living now. It's like the Bible talks about the pearl of great price. Man sold everything he had to buy it because there's nothing else I want. I've got to go to work because I've got bills. You know, life's not perfect. Are my circumstances perfect? No, my circumstances are not perfect. Do I still have crap to deal with? Yes. You know, Jesus said, you're going to have troubles in this world. But be a good cheer. All I know is I've got joy. I've had one desire to drink. And one more story I'm going to share. Uh, Kathy, who's sitting back here waving your hand, she and I went to a conference. She asked me to go to a conference with her. And we, it was about two weeks ago now. And we I'd never been to a conference. I didn't know what to expect. I thought, what am I, you know, what am I going to receive by going to this conference? But it ended up being what used what God used us to give out. Because we, we were praying for people, people were getting touched, people were getting delivered. A woman could not produce natural tears, and her friend asked me and Kathy to pray for her. We start praying for the woman, and she starts gnashing her teeth. And we're like, okay, then she's got some sort of demonic oppression. I'm talking about this like it's every day, because literally it is almost every day now. It's like you see this all the time, and it's real. So we just started praying against the, uh, heart issues. She had some unforgiveness in her heart. I had unforgiveness and bitterness. I can assure you, unforgiveness and bitterness will open the door to the demonic in your life. I'm not kidding. I've seen sick people.
get their physical healing after they renounce their unforgiveness. And the Bible says, let your body prosper as your soul prospers. And your soul is not prospering if you're angry or bitter. or And there's nothing wrong with that. We get hurt. That's part of life. We get hurt. But just this past week, I put it on my heart that Jesus washed Judas the betrayer. Jesus washed his feet. Jesus already knew, this is the man that's going to betray me to my death. And yet Jesus still washed his feet. And if Jesus, I don't care who you're mad at, none of those people have betrayed you to death because you're still in your breathing. So whoever you're mad at, whoever has hurt you, whoever has wounded you, you can forgive them. Because Jesus, you know, Jesus sets the example. And so we start praying for this lady, but unforgiveness, we walk her through that, she renounces some stuff, God's touching her heart, and as, after she does that, tears start rolling we weren't even praying for her physical healing. As God touched her heart, he healed her physically. And, th I mean, that's, it's so key. It's so key. And toward the end of that conference, there was a little young couple, and I'd seen them over the past couple days, and they just kind of touched my heart. They just kind of stirred my heart. They were a sweet little couple. And uh, it was toward the end of the conference, and the people were starting to leave. It was the last night, and I had seen them for the past couple days, but never said anything to them, and I saw little wife just up there worshiping, and I thought, well, she's sweet. I'm going to go pray for her. So I walked up to her and said, Can I, is it okay if I just pray for you? And she said, yeah, I'd love it if you pray for me. So I just started praying for her, and as I started praying for her, she starts shaking. I mean, a lot of times when the Holy Spirit touches somebody, they will have a physical little shake or something. She starts shaking. And as I'm praying for her, I saw in my mind a picture of her standing in a room with a, with a bunch of little kids sitting around her in a circle looking up at her. And I shared with her what I saw. And I said, by chance has God called you to teach? And she just broke down and started weeping. And as soon as she was able to talk, she said, yes. She said, I was a teacher before, but I'm in a new job now. But God has called me to teach. And that the little kids, that's the age that I just love. And it's like, you know, well, God knows. He knows. And I, I said, I anticipate he'll get you back in teaching at some point. And I said, bring your husband over here. I want to pray for you guys before you go home. And they were from Minnesota. They had driven 10 hours. This was in Springfield, Missouri. They had driven 10 hours. So I just started praying for them as a couple. And just these words just started flowing. I said, I just see you guys as a strong couple, that you live in harmony, that you don't fight, that you've got a solid relationship, that you're equally yoked, that you guys work together. And I said, I feel like God is going to use you to mentor younger couples. But God's also going to send older couples to you to learn from you. <coughs> and when those words left my mouth, both of them like jolted. I felt them jolt. And it was just like the Holy Spirit, pow, hit them. And they told me that they'd gotten, a year ago they'd gone to the Voice of the Apostles conference and gotten a very similar word. But they said, when they spoke that over the younger couples and older couples, they said word for word, verbatim, we got that very same word six hours ago from another person at this conference. So when I prayed that over them, it's just like, boom, the Holy Spirit just hit them. And so she finds me on Facebook, and she starts sending me messages over the next week. Conference is gone. And I had no idea. I knew they were touched, but I had no idea how radically they were touched. Uh, she told me that they had been addicted to marijuana. I, I didn't pray against addiction. God didn't show me anything about addiction. They didn't look like pot smokers. I don't know what pot, you know, like I said, I, I don't know what they're supposed to look like. But they, you know, they were, they were clean. They, were, they just looked, you know. And she opens up. She ends up sending me a huge email. And she said, I've been addicted to marijuana for 15 years. And my husband for 17 years. We started smoking in high school. She said, we got married. We were smoking every day. We decided to grow our own to save money. So they started growing their own. But then it got a little bigger, and they started growing for their closest friends. And so it was nine years ago that they started growing. They had been growing weed for nine years. And um, they bought a new house and built a secret room onto this new house, a secret doorway that looked like a bookcase. And she sent me photos of all this, and I've got them on this poster where I'm going to pass it around and let you guys see it. I had no idea what God was doing with you guys. It wasn't me. All he needs is someone to step out in obedience. Right. My, my heart was tender toward this couple, but I didn't know why. You know why? Because God's heart was tender toward them. And 
So they built this, and she said, the Holy Spirit had convicted us a year ago to stop all this, but we couldn't because of the money. But she said that her husband was so wrecked by the Holy Spirit after he left that conference, he couldn't even drive. And they, she said they couldn't eat for three days. They couldn't sleep for three days. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? God, you're good. And they were driving back to Minnesota. The husband looked at her and said, you know what? I don't have a desire to smoke anymore. How about you? And she said, I don't either. So they get home, and they threw into the fire and destroyed $20,000 worth of marijuana ready to sell and plants that would have been worth $30,000 in two months. <coughs> That's $50,000 worth if they threw it in a fire and destroyed it. Yeah, and I was blown away. That is what a true encounter of God will do. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And I'll, this, I'll, I'll just close with this to show you guys the photos. You know, I looked at, and I've got a photo of the, here's the bookcase, and this is the bookcase open that's actually the doorway, and there's a, pictures of a bunch of pot down there, and I don't, I'm not skilled in selling dope, so I really, by looking at this, this didn't, you know, I didn't, it didn't mean anything to me, I mean, I, you know, until she told me what it was worth, and what the plants were going to be worth, but when someone starts destroying $50,000 worth of revenue, you know that something has happened in, that is real. And it was not me. So he just wants us to be the simplest acts of obedience. The loft people who started the eight people who followed, who listened to God's call and they were obedient. They started a Bible study in an apartment on Tuesday nights in early 2015. And because they were obedient, my daughter is not dead. She's alive. She would be dead today. You guys, you guys didn't know what what ripples, like ripples in a pond, what it was going to affect. They've got people now in Minnesota who've been set free from 17 years of addiction because these people stepped out in obedience and started this Bible study. And then I stepped into Do you see how it works? Do you see how it works? My daughter is alive instead of dead. I would have been divorced. I would have been still drinking. My daughter would be dead. These people would still be on weed. It's because they stepped out and did what God called them to do. So I want to encourage you guys. First of all, if you got junk in your life, and there's no shame. That's right. There's no shame. I was a wreck. Man, I was a wreck. I was, a, I was crying snot out my nose. I had left a puddle of snot underneath me. But you know what? It was cleansing, and it was good. And when I stood up off that floor, I was different. It's nothing, you know? You can stay where you are and keep Letting the enemy, because you know what, each one of you has a destiny, and there's nothing special about me, because Jesus has called all of us to step into this thing. By me going and praying for these people, any one of you could have prayed for those kids. There's nothing special about me. The only thing is that I chose to step into what Jesus has called every single one of us to do. Every one of you has a destiny. Every one of you has spiritual gifts. You've got a Holy Spirit Swiss Army knife that you can take it out and use whatever for whoever you're praying for. And he will change people through you. It's all a matter of understanding who you are. But first of all, if you've got any junk in your life, I don't care what it is. Because I'm going to have my prayer team come up. Because there's a whole people, a whole group of people here that God has radically encountered and delivered them in some way. And they pray for people. And there's nothing that anybody can say that's going to shake them up or upset them. So... Get up here and get, do not leave this hill with the junk that you came with. And then get about his business. Get about his, his, you know, get in his word. His word's exciting now. I used to hate it. Do what he's called you to do. Do what he's destined you to do. So I don't know, if, I don't know if Carl, if you have anything at all that you could add or...